Good evening and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library's online series of signature events. I'm Katie Stover, the Director of Reader Services. Our guest tonight is J.B. McKinnon, author of The Day the World Stops Shopping. Perhaps you're wondering exactly what day is that? Did it already happen? Is it scheduled and fell off your calendar? Is it a date to be announced at a later date? Will you be able to take advantage of Prime Day before the consumerism comes to a halt? If we couldn't shop, what would that do to our economy, the planet, our own psyches? What would you say if you knew this had already happened? This evening, J.B. McKinnon is going to talk about this thought experiment, what would happen if we stopped shopping? I hope you are as fascinated with JB's subject as I am and pick up a copy of The Day the World Stops Shopping through bookshop.org. JB is an award-winning journalist and author of five books of narrative nonfiction, each of which will make you view the world in a whole new way. He definitely has an eye for nature and science. His writing has appeared in the best American science and nature writing anthologies. He has also written for The New Yorker, National Geographic, and The Atlantic. In two of his books, JB has considered what the natural world would be like with more wild spaces and what our diet would be like if we only ate what we could get in a 100 mile radius. He looked at the stresses of human interactions on the life of a female grizzly bear in Bear 71, a unique documentary experience. Clearly, he is fascinated with how humans impact the natural world and vice versa. So tonight, Let's explore what our world might be like if we all engaged in less shopping. Please welcome J.B. McKinnon. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> so, J.B., I've never heard of a book described as a thought experiment before. Why use this phrase to describe your book? Well, I just couldn't find other any other way into this subject. I was faced with this this thing that in the book I call the consumer dilemma, which is this idea that the planet seems to need us to slow down our, our rate of consumption. But um, we do kind of recognize that if we do that, the, the economy seems to crash. Uh, so the only way I could see to, to kind of look beyond that was, was to play it out on the page. And uh, I knew that on the written page, I could make the world stop shopping and see what happens. And uh, so that's what I did, just played it out as a thought experiment. You also traveled around the world to see what it would be like in certain areas of the world where shopping isn't as important as it is in other countries. What was that like? How did that contribute to your book? Yeah, I didn't want it to only be a thought experiment. I didn't want it to only play out in my head as a, as a speculation. Uh, so what I wanted to do was ground the whole thing in in reality, so talk to people in places where, where consumption and shopping had slowed down in some significant way, or where or where people had never really gotten started in the first place, um, and to talk to experts who'd looked at this either through computer models or through research that kind of angled in on it in one way or another. So yeah, that took me from the Namibian desert and you know a, a, an indigenous culture there that has lived with a minimum of possessions for about 150,000 years uh, through to Japan, where economic growth has been stalled for about 30 years, um, to Ecuador, where people are living at a, a level at which if we all lived like the average Ecuadorian, we'd, we'd be able to get by with the resources we have on the planet <laughs> that we have right now today. Um, yeah, it, it um, I roamed the world and um, it involved a lot of consumption, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you came back and the world pretty much stopped and we had to stop shopping. What, what did that do for your research? What did that do for, what did that do for us? Well, I mean, it gave me a heart attack um, <laughs> first uh, because I was nearly finished the book when so I, I had I had pretty much played out this thought experiment, and then and then it happened, and then the the thought experiment became real, and um, I yeah at first I didn't really know what that meant for me, but uh, I, I pr pretty quickly realized that it was an opportunity to see whether the kinds of ideas I was exploring in the thought experiment would play out in real life. And, and they, and they really did. I mean, it was, um, 
uh, I was just watching with fascination as all of these things that people had said had predicted were the kinds of things that were ha would happen happened in front of my eyes. Was, is is that the consumer dilemma you mentioned earlier? Did you see? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you saw it play out in both ways, right? You saw, you did see really serious economic consequences uh, start to add up immediately almost. But at the same time, you saw you saw carbon emissions drop uh, more sharply than we'd ever seen in recorded history. And of course, everyone will remember, you know, the sky is cleared. <laughs> I was paying attention to some of these Asian cities that make a lot of the consumer goods that we use. And I mean, if we were struck by the difference in our skies in, you know, in places like the United States and Canada, where I live, um, in Asia, it was absolutely almost miraculous that, you know, the skies going from, from a really soupy orange yellow in some places and, and week upon week of hazardous air to yeah, blue skies and being able to count the stars at night. So um, really, uh, really striking changes, and and all of them were things that um, that I had been talking to people about right up to the cusp of the pandemic. So, do you mind talking a little bit about the positive aspects of shopping less and what that could do, what that could do for the economy? Um, in which business sectors did we see growth, even as we purchased less? Well, uh, I mean, if we think about how stopping shopping could could play out over time there's all kinds of different places that you might see you might still see growth in fact companies that are leaning this in this kind of direction uh, they're they're expecting to see growth by by a shift towards you know ironically they're expecting to see growth by encouraging people to buy fewer things that's kind of tricky to explain, but the, you know, basically what they're doing is companies like Patagonia or Levi's, uh, Eileen Fisher, companies that are moving in that direction, um, they are expecting that, that there are enough people out there who like the idea of slowing down consumption, that they will get on board and um, those companies will pick up market share by sending out a message that they want people to buy less stuff. Uh, and it's working for at least, you know, it's certainly been working for, for Patagonia, um, which has seen like double di digit growth while promoting uh, a, an aesthetic of like, hey, live with, live with a little bit less, buy, buy fewer things, buy fewer even of our things. Um, but there's other areas like, um, you know, if we make goods more durable, then we need to buy fewer of them. But that also means that you then need to maintain them and repair them. And if we look in the past, then you see that those, you know, repair, maintenance, uh, secondhand, these were much larger and more kind of mainstream parts of the economy in the past and much, much bigger. And, uh, and they, could, they could grow again. Um, and there's also an opportunity just to spend money on innovation. Um, you know, we spend a lot of money on just stuff and you know, th things that we don't necessarily get a lot out of as, um, as society or as individuals. And if we channeled more of that wealth into, into innovation, um, then we might see quicker solutions to some of the serious problems we have, and there would be growth associated with that. So would we, if we stopped buying stuff and we focus our money on experiences or services, is, will that Will that contribute to the good that less shopping could do for the planet and our psyche and our economy? Can we make it up that way? Uh, I'm afraid it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, ultimately when I, in the book, I mean, the term shopping I use as kind of a shorthand for the, for the whole consumer lifestyle in a sense, for consumerism itself. And it doesn't really help that much to turn from consuming a lot of goods to consuming a lot of services or to consuming a lot of experiences. So for example, uh, if we switch from, you know, buying a lot of clothes to taking a lot of trips, um, then certainly in terms of the ecological effects of that, you, you, there's a pretty good chance that you'd be doing, um, you, your consumption would have as many consequences or more in terms of 
you know negative effects on the environment and and uh, and on society. So um, it really does come down to trying to figure out ways to consume less of those things. And then the most satisfying path forward around that seems to be um, fewer, better things, experiences, and services. So uh, that's that's kind of the model. That's kind of the model to look to. And of course, uh, really asking ourselves the question of, well, what are we getting out of all this consumption we're doing? I mean, if consumer spending in the United States increased by 25% in the last 15 years, did we see a 25% increase in satis life satisfaction or quality of life or happiness? Or, you know, I don't, I don't think we did. And I don't think very many people would say we did. So uh, at that point, we're not adding a lot and we're doing quite a bit of harm. Um, so it seems an, op you know, an opportune moment to, to rethink the way we're doing this. You mentioned how people think and feel about their shopping. And that leads me to probably the element of this book that fascinates me the most, which is the effects shopping and consumerism has on our, on our psyches, uh, why we do it and why for some people it feels so scary to have less or to not shop. And I mean, I'm as guilty of retail therapy as the person <laughs> and, and, and who hasn't drunk purchased anything online. <laughs> but what what is the what's the impact on us as humans if we lessen our shopping? What did the, what did your psychologist say about that? Yeah, I mean th this was one of the great moments in terms of watching the pandemic play out because uh, I had this conversation on, I think it was January 30th, 2020. I was talking to a psychologist named Tim Kasser, who's you know, possibly the, um, you know, the world expert on the psychology of materialism. And he, he, he'd been saying to me, well, well, I'd been asking him like, if, if people stop shopping, um, you know, what would happen? And he said, well, you know, they would shift from materialist values and materialist values are values that are really rooted in things like possessions and income and status. And um, we would shift from those kinds of values towards more inherently satisfying values like uh, um, developing strong relationships with people we care about or uh, spending time in the natural world or mastering some, some skill. Um, taking care of our physical mental health, you know, things like this, that, that they're, they're satisfying, you know, whether or not anybody else is watching us do them. And uh, I said, Oh, that's great. That sounds good. How quickly would we make that shift? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> Later that same day, they declare, you know, a world uh, health emergency and the pandemic begins. People start going into quarantine and lockdown. And we saw people make that shift very, very quickly. Right. I mean, we remember, um, people getting into their gardens and uh, walking, you know, walking in nature, um, immediately securing their social contacts, even if that was over the telephone and over Zoom, um, that was a priority for people to, and, and people reaching out to people they hadn't contacted for, for years and investing time in their, you know, getting to know their families again, in some cases. Um, we saw that that transformation start to happen really, really quickly. It did. It. I know that it did in my in my world. Um, brought my brothers and sisters and I to together. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's fascinating to think about what what not focusing on things can do for your do for your worldview. Um, what about you? Touched briefly on this, talking about. Um, skies in Asia becoming clear. What about the environment? What else, what else other impacts does not shopping have on the environment? Uh, you know, almost everything gets better, basically. <laughs> you, uh, I mean, since about the year 2000, um, consumption has been the biggest driver in, in, in the world as a whole. And, for a, a long list of environmental problems from deforestation to, you know, 
depletion of water resources, the climate pollution, pollution in general, um, all kinds of different things. So if you scale back um, consumption, then yeah, the planet just begins to rebound. And so we saw that uh, not only in terms of blue skies and emissions and things like that, but also, uh, I mean, everyone will remember the, the, the way that wildlife started to return to places that it hadn't been able to get to. And um, one of my favorites was uh, photos I saw of American crocodiles surfing the waves and basking on the beaches of Mexico in the absence of uh, mass tourism. And of course, mass tourism is a, you know, is a big, big part of uh, the consumer lifestyle these days. So it, uh, yeah, it, suddenly we were sharing the planet with non-human species in a way that we haven't for a very long time. <laughs> Um, but so, I mean, one of the cases I looked at was the North Atlantic right whale, which is a very rare whale. It's an endangered species uh, in the United States. It lives on the East Coast. And um, the, direct, the connection to its, its survival and the impact of consumption is incredibly direct. I mean, one of the major ways that they are killed is by cargo ships, you know, bringing stuff, <laughs> bringing stuff across the Atlantic to ports on the East Coast, and running into these whales. And um, I was talking to an activist, you know, trying to save the whales over there, and he's like, every time we push that buy button on Amazon, um, we're helping load those ships, right? So, it's, uh, yeah, the the effects are, uh, they would be everywhere. <laughs> So how do we do this? Um, it's, it's difficult to think how we can accomplish a major pullback in consumerism. How do we convince enough people to spend less, to consume less? Can, do you think it can be voluntary or will society have to be forced the way they were during the pandemic? Um, I mean, uh, I think it can be voluntary to some extent. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people Right now, for example, I think a lot of people have had reckonings with their priorities. They've realized in the pandemic what kinds of consumption are really important and valuable to them and what parts are not. Um, and you do see people, you know, you see resistance, for example, to, to getting back to uh, the full throttle 60 hour work weeks and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and people recognizing that, okay, well, if I don't do that, then I'm not going to earn as much money and I'm going to have to live a little more simply. And, you know, you certainly see people taking trade-offs like that really seriously right now. And that's, that's kind of exciting. But um, I guess I'd say that the one way we shouldn't try to move towards a deconsumer society is by everybody stopping shopping <laughs> overnight because it's, it, it, it's really uh, hard on the economy and the consequences are pretty brutal what we would want to do is move that direction um, gradually uh, by making changes in the way that we do business, um, by slowly reducing consumption, changing systems, the systems that we, that we live in so that it's easier for us to, to, uh, uh, to consume less. And one of the sort of really simple ways of thinking about that is over the past little while, we've all seen the trend towards more and more disposable goods. I don't think anyone is very excited about that trend. Um, I think we probably, almost all of us, would like to see things move back towards being uh, longer lasting and you know more durable and higher quality. And um, and if we, so you know, there are specific things we can do to to start moving in that direction and away from disposability. And if we do those things, then um, then you and I don't have to think about it all the time. You know, we don't have to go and pick up a sweater and be like, "Will this last two weeks or twenty years?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, I often don't know, right? So um, we would like, I think, to just be able to go out and and buy things, and they'll last longer, and we automatically consume less. That um, that leads me to a, another question one that uh, I'm going to pull in some technology because how do we apply these tennis to technology? That's an industry that, that builds in obsolescence in order to advance. It's pretty disposable. And, and I don't like to think about where my old iPhone goes when I upgrade, but 
how do we handle how do we handle technology and consumerism if technology is banking on us to replace our our devices yeah, I mean, I think you said it just right. They're banking on us. <laughs> oh, right, yes. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that it's, it's, it's not technologically necessary, right? I mean, one one place I, I looked at, um, there's a company in Europe, uh, their phones aren't available, uh, certainly not easily uh, adaptable to North American systems. But um, in Europe, you can buy a phone called Fairphone and it's, it's modular. And by that, I mean, if my camera's not working or I want to update my camera, then I just pop open the phone, pull out the camera, um, buy a new camera, pop it in. And I mean, I sat down with the, with the, you know, the, the people at Fairphone and they showed me, they showed me how to do this and it was done in less than a minute. And I would have, I would be able to do it myself. They would just send me the camera and I'd be pop my phone open, replace my camera. So, I mean, I think that's often the case, right? That it's not that we need a whole new phone. We might like one of the new um, innovations that have that are added to, you know, iPhone uh, 23 or whatever it's going to be, right? Um, being able to just select those kinds of updates of the physical phone would be one one way to do this. Um, but you know, I, I think there's also just the question of how much tech do we maybe as a society we could think a lot harder about um, do we always want to be moving into these whole new areas of of technology i mean things like virtual reality for example incredibly energy intensive uh probably will you know has the potential to have really overwhelming social effects and social consequences i mean Given all of that, um, maybe just as a society, we want to have a little bit more serious conversation about it before we take the plunge. Uh, we've had a couple of questions pop in from the audience, and this next one, this one harkens back to a couple of things we were talking about earlier. But there's obviously been a big spike in consumerism as the lockdowns are lifted. Is there any indication that that spike might taper off and we could settle at a level of consumerism that's higher than it was during the pandemic, but still lower than it was pre-pandemic? Um, is there any sign of I would say there's no sign of it. Um, and I doubt that that's the way we'll go. I mean, <laughs> one of the things I look at in the book is the, the history of these um, of these slowdowns. So uh, there have been slowdowns in the consumer economy a number of different times through history, and um, they are always followed by a rush back to consumption and, in fact, mm -hmm. to higher levels of consumption than prior to the downturn. That's that's the, the historical pattern, and um, I personally suspect that's where we're headed right now. Uh, but that said, um, all of those instances were also really great opportunities to talk about it, right? And I think that's where we're at with consumption right now. Um, it's a it's a topic that we need to put at the center of our conversations around um, what we want our lives to look like and and sustainability. You know, this big question of how do we how do we sustain human society in a in a responsible relationship with the limited resources we have on the planet? Well. Um, you know, the, we, what we need to do is start talking about that and talking about the scale of consumption and, and whether or not um, just constantly growing uh, consumption is contributing so much to our lives that it's really worth pursuing. And I think, I think for most people at an individual level who have met not only their basic needs, but, um, but, but much more than that, I think the answer is, is no. And, and the science indicates that we don't add a lot to our lives by by consuming more, um, particularly in the richer um, nations of the world. So is a conscious decision to curb spending, that decision, is that a luxury that only the upper classes can afford to make? Well, it's actually, it's actually the, it's the decision that the upper classes have the greatest responsibility to make. So <laughs> whether or not they have the luxury, um, you know, the world's looking to them. <laughs> so it's, uh, I mean, the richer nations and the richest people in those nation nations are by far the greatest consumers. I mean, by far 
Um, you look at things, even if you look at, for example, flights, uh, about 50% of Americans rarely, if ever, uh, fly. That's like half the country. Um, so to be doing as much flying as, as Americans are doing, a small group of people has to be doing a lot of it. And then if you think about the rest of the world, I mean, it's still perfectly normal in much of the world to have flown uh, never or uh, very, very infrequently. And so again, it's like these, these small cluster of people in a small cluster of nations that are, that are overwhelmingly responsible for the, for the consequences of consumption. Which leads me to an audience question that just popped up that you cited Ecuador as a model of modest consumption. In what ways is it and, and why there? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the, there are lots of countries that are consuming um, where the average person is consuming, uh, you know, radically less than people in, in the United States on average, um, or, you know, Canada, Australia, you name it, uh, Europe. But I went to Ecuador because Ecuador is a country where, um, well, a lot of people will have heard this statistic that if we all consumed like the average American, we would need five planets five planet Earth's worth of resources to provide that that lifestyle to, to everyone, right? Um, so it's a pretty shocking statistic, but it also suggested to me, I was like, well, you know, <laughs> is there a place where we can say if we all consumed like the citizens of nation X, Y, or Z, um, we could get by on just the one planet. And then I narrowed that down to, uh, well, there were lots. So then I narrowed that down to, well, which of those countries has the highest degree of development. So I've narrowed that down to a small list of countries that are rated as highly developed nations by the United Nations, but are consuming at a level of, you know, what's called one planet living. Um, and, uh, and then I picked Ecuador, you know, um, for a few different reasons, but uh, partly because I, I can speak Spanish reasonably well, so, and I don't speak Arabic, say, so Tunisia was uh, ruled out. But um, the, the interesting thing is that, is that fact that it's like, you can have both uh, a pretty sustainable level of consumption and a high degree of development as measured by the United Nations. And that lifestyle would look, um, it would look familiar to a lot of people who remember what consumption looked like in the 60s or in a lot of communities into the 70s. Um, you know, certainly if you think back to the 1950s uh, in the United States, consumption levels were, were dramatically lower, but uh, life was, you know, not that bad for a lot of people. So um, that's kind of what it feels like to go to, to Ecuador. It's like, well, this all looks familiar. People still do the same kind of things we do. It doesn't, it certainly doesn't look like a trip to the stone age. Uh, and yet, wow, you know, these people are, are consuming at a level that we could all live like this and, uh, and do it on the resources we have on this planet. We don't have to send, you know, Jeff Bezos to, to the moon um, or Elon Musk to Mars. So, Phoebe, would it be more equitable, do you think? Would we, would we flatten our class, classes in society? We would, would we raise up our lower classes? And, and I know that the upper class would have to function with a little bit less, but do you see, do you see more economic, um, economic e equality? Yeah, equality, yeah. Um, this is a really great question <laughs> because uh, in my experiment, um, everybody stops shopping, right? So uh, rich or poor, if you're consuming, you know, too much in my, in my thought experiment, then, then you, you slow, you slow that down a lot. Uh, so in my experiment, it is, you know, it's pretty equitable, but um, that's pretty far from the real world. So <laughs> uh, what I think we can say about it is that there's a, there's a few different ways that you could achieve a lower consuming society. And one of them is like the plot of the hun hunger games, right? Where you have a <laughs> tiny sliver of people who are incredibly privileged and live in extraordinary luxury. And then a whole pile of people um, who are living a very bare bones existence. And um, 
so there's that. There's that model of getting to a to a you know a world that consumes less, and that's to be honest, that's kind of the model, sort of like the model we're working on right now, <laughs> where there are so many people who who consume so much more than than so many many other people. But I guess the point that comes out of this is that um, if you are slowing your consumption, then questions of equity become more and more important. Um, and in part, that's because uh, it is probably, we talked about growth earlier, but it's probably true that if we all uh, reduce, if we all consume less good services and experiences, probably we're going to end up with a smaller, slower churning economy. And then the wealth that gets produced within that, it becomes even more important that that be shared you know, a little more, that we find ways that that, that that wealth be spread a little more evenly than it is today, because um, for the simple reason that there's less of it. Uh, and also that sort of opportunities to, to work within an economy like that are spread more, more equitably as, as well. But, um, you know, that's, that's the ideal and human, human nature does its own thing. <laughs> How can a decrease in shopping in, in consumerism improve our quality of life? Um, is there a positive impact to the unemployment, the less tax revenue and or the country's political stability if there's a decline in consumerism? Yeah, I mean, there's tons of potential uh, positives. Yeah, one is, uh, for example, people talk a lot about time famine, you know, people just not having the time to spend uh, on themselves, on, you know, on their families, uh, on, on things they really care about. And so if you do have uh, an economy that's uh, churning more slowly, then things like sharing work, shorter work days, shorter work weeks, these sorts of things start to make a lot more sense. And, uh, and that gives people uh, free time. And it gives people, more people, more time to do, uh, to do the things that they are, you know, that they are longing for in, in very heavily scheduled lives like we have today. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge um, plus and, and positive thing. Um, of course, you get, you get a much more, um, you know, I, I, I always lean towards the word magical. I mean, I think you end up with this much more magical kind of planet, right? Because uh, the natural world is, is just so much more uh, refulgent than it is right now. Um, you have, uh, you can have uh, a lot less debt, you know, things like that. People wouldn't, you know, in theory, at least, they're not going to be as powerfully motivated to keep up with the Joneses and, um, engage in that kind of social competition that we do with with consumption, so uh, people don't have those stresses of of, uh, of debt. And these are all the these are all well. And I guess maybe big, biggest and best of all is that you do have that opportunity to um, invest your time and energy in that different set of values, right? The inherently uh, satisfying set of values, and. I mean, this all starts to sound kind of utopian, but this is exactly what you hear from people who've been practicing simple living type lifestyles for a long time. And I talk to people who've been doing that for 30, 40 years, and um, this is what they report. You know, they say, yeah, I mean, I've got time. I feel I don't do as many things as other people, but I feel as rich or richer than them uh, because of my my you know, my leisure time, um, the satisfaction I've taken in, in simple pleasures, uh, my, my stronger relationships with people I care about because I have the time to do that um, and to invest in those values. Um, you, do, you do start to see uh, really attractive positives about it if, you're, if you talk to people around the world who, who actually practice this stuff. Almost as if we are, we're owned by our things instead of <laughs> our things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, oddly, one of the things that happened to me in the process of writing this book was that I became a lot more compassionate about our, ourselves and our our consumption because um, we beat our, a lot of us beat ourselves up about it. You know, we're we're we feel guilty about it for about 
10 different reasons, right? <laughs> and it can be the environment. It can be because we just put ourselves deeper in debt. It can be because like, we know we shouldn't have bought that thing, but you know, um, we, we just really wanted to in the moment. And, and uh, I mean, part of what you see from this consumer dilemma is that we live in a consumer society, right? Like that's how it's, that's, it's designed that way. You know, the economy can't run without our, without our consumption as it's currently organized. So of course we're consumers, you know, if, what else would we be in a consumer society? There's tremendous pressure on us to do it. Um, if we slow down, the government cuts checks and sends them to us and says, get back <laughs> to the mall. You know, the president of the United States will say, um, I'd like you to go shopping more as George W. Bush did. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it. We shouldn't we shouldn't be shocked to to wake up each day and say like, "Hey, I'm a consumer. I'm going to go consume things." It's like, of course we do. I remember that. I remember that directive from my president, and I remember <laughs> following his directive and choosing to pay a bill instead <laughs> to be a responsible citizen. This is a lovely segue into an audience question. Uh, it almost seems like a lot of people accumulate stuff and then never get rid of it because they still think it must have some value, even if it really no longer does. So how big of a difference would it make if we just started thinking about every purchase in terms of what is this purchase really going to do and or be worth to me a month from now or a year from now? Oh, I mean, it would make a huge difference if people did that. Um, they, 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 you hear a lot about you know, debt counselors and things like that will say, sleep on it, right? <laughs> sleep on it before you buy that thing. Um, because even just that process, even, even in fact, um, like a one minute timeout will often get people to, to change their minds about whether or not to buy something. But I think um, maybe more important is like, well, how would we, how do we build a system that, that allows us to do that? <laughs> you know, how do we get, how do we have, larger scale messaging that says, hey, take some time before you you buy things because buying those things has consequences. Um, it'll have consequences on you. It'll have consequences on, on, uh, on the planet. Um, I think that's the bigger question because I could say, hey, try and take a minute, but really you're going to get, you know, you'd hear that from me. And then in the next 24 hours, you'd get 15,000 marketing messages and I'm not going to win. <laughs> so, you know, we need to, uh, we need to really look at, um, at questions like that, but oddly enough, I mean, they're quite tightly connected in places that consume less, that's less advertising. Um, and every time you see a slowdown in consumption in a, even in economies like the American economy, uh, you also see, uh, advertising slow down really quickly. So um, the two do seem to be, you know, they do seem to be tightly connected in that way. That's a great, uh, that's a great response that ties into an audience question that that's going to take us back to technology. When you said you're only one person, but then 15 messages coming from likely our devices, but an audience member wants to know, are the advances in technology a positive in the effort to contain consumerism or a negative? Oh, I mean, I don't think I could say either way on that one. What I would say though, is for example, like green technology, uh, mm -hmm. the pursuit of green technology and renewable energy, um, they're, they have the, pos the potential to be positive, but in a lot of cases they don't turn out to be positive. And I think the reason for that is that, um, if we green the consumption, but we don't change the relationship with, with how we can, if we don't change the way we consume, um, then it becomes very, very difficult to green away all of its negative impacts. So, uh, you know, it's, for example, if we, um, if we buy, uh, more, you know, if everyone on earth just wants to buy more and more and more clothing, which has been the pattern um, for quite a while now. I mean, how are we going to make all of that clothing um, so green that it doesn't have any more consequences? And then um, green that for everybody else on earth who's trying to achieve the same you know, amount of 
of uh, clothing consumption as the average American or the average Canadian, and then green everybody's consumption in per, you know, in, in in perpetual growth. <laughs> you know, you start to see the problem. So, I mean, this is why we've seen. I mean, over the past twenty years, we've seen a ton of focus on um, trying to draw down carbon emissions. We've seen great leaps forward in technologies related to that. Um, lots more renewable energy being used, much more efficient appliances and things like this. And yet at a global scale, we have yet to reduce carbon emissions for even a single year uh, from those kinds of changes. And the only times, st still so far in history, the only times that we've reduced carbon emissions at a global scale in a year have come from uh, recessions and uh, other kinds of economic collapse. So when we stop shopping, <laughs> carbon <laughs> emissions go down. And when we are in full throttle uh, consumerism mode as a planet, uh, it's really hard to, to draw them down. I'm going to tie us a little bit to libraries right now. Uh, I'm going to mention a blog post that you wrote over on HarperCollins Library Love Fest. Um, where you thought libraries might benefit from a world with less shopping activity. How is that? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, libraries are in fact a great, uh, a great example of a lower consuming structure because uh, rather than every individual having to buy a book like mine, which, you know, also I should add <laughs> helps me to put food on the table. Um, uh, rather than everybody having to do that, uh, lots and lots of people can go to the library and, and get that book and, and read that book. And, and of course, the library as a model uh, has been expanded to some other things. Um, there are tool libraries. Uh, there are lending libraries for different kinds of products. Uh, but I mean, the book library, the, 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 the information-based library is still the standout example and, uh, and a very good one of how we can get uh, the benefits of consumption with dramatically less uh, dramatically less purchasing of the individual new product. Which leads me to another audience question that came in very early in the program. What about spending we might do on information like books, magazines, online content? How um, negative or positive impact? Just... Well, I mean, I, I, I just keep going back to the, the sort of fewer, better, everything model. Um, right now, I think tons and tons of information pour through our heads, um, pour into and through our heads, but I'm not convinced and I, that they, you know, that all of that information is helpful to us or, or adding much to our lives, right? A lot of it, um, a lot of it even if it's important, you know, we just don't engage with it at a level that that's very meaningful. So even slowing down our consumption of information, I think has the potential to be uh, really, really helpful, um, really healthy, <laughs> uh, allow us to more deeply engage with uh, fewer, um, fewer forms of information and entertainment. I think even there we can see benefits from, from a slowdown. And uh, that again would have, uh, it would have economic consequences um, that, you know, we, we need to really, <clears throat> you know, that, that's the really big picture part of this is that um, we need to confront the possibility that, that we make these big transformations towards um, like what this slower, something maybe smaller economy looks like and how it, how it works. You mentioned the, the uh, absorption of all this information and that leads me to the fun question we were just bandying about in the green room. And this might be a little off topic, but what happens to our fascination with consumer culture, such as keeping up with the Kardashians or that oldie but goodie TV show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, or <laughs> Crazy Rich Asians books I was telling you I was reading. Consumer culture is, is a form of entertainment now. 
<laughs> what happened? Well, I mean, talk about some of the powerful forces, right? That that are compelling us to consume. It's uh, lifestyle television is is a big one. <laughs> you know, it's uh, oh my lifestyle Instagram. What what? Yeah, happens there? It's, Instagram is just so interesting to me because it's, uh, I was reading a book from the 1990s by a, a, a woman who studied uh, kind of the effects of consumerism back then. And, and she pointed out that, you know, science has shown that we consume visibly consumable things like lipstick or shoes or cars, you know, we consume those quite differently than we do uh, products that are, that are you know, not visible to us for the most part. And examples, um, I think she gave the examples of things like hot water heaters and bedroom curtains. Oh boy, you know, it's not hard to find bedroom curtains on Instagram anymore. It's not hard to find hot water tanks even uh, in social media being sort of you know proudly um, showing off to the rest of the world. So social media was like a big bang for for conspicuous consumption, which is a you know just a well-known driver of of consumerism. So. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what the effect of slowing that down looks like, uh, I think, I mean, this is, this is a really interesting question. I mean, cause it's so, you know, <laughs> trying to think through, think how it all happens is really complex, but suppose you do see people actually, I mean, you actually did see this in the pandemic, for example, um, as people made this shift away from, um, like as the opportunity to express materialist, classic materialist values kind of dried up in quarantines and lockdowns, um, and people shifted their their value footing a little bit, you suddenly saw things like uh, billionaires getting mocked off of Instagram for showing themselves quarantining on yachts in the Caribbean. And that's the kind of stuff that was the bread and butter of Instagram, you know, three weeks earlier. So <laughs> suddenly, you if you have this turn in the values, then suddenly you see people much less interested in what the Kardashians are up to, uh, and and possibly even starting to say, uh, showing off your wealth and your material lifestyles is um, you know is tasteless and <laughs> offensive and. Um, you know, and you you are celebrating things that that um, are you know deeply questionable in terms of their impacts. So, uh, yeah, it would be really interesting to see if that was the kind of thing that might play out. Certainly, in the book, one thing I look at is is the rich. You know, the fact: can you be rich in a lower consuming society? And the answer is yes. Um, if you look into the past, of course. Um, Rich people in the past had far fewer uh, consumer goods than a lot of kind of middle class people do today. So richness doesn't have anything particularly to do with a specific level of possessions or things like that. It just has to do with um, prestige and privilege in society. And people can have that with or without a lot of stuff. So our perceptions of consumerism and the importance that we place on it in society has shifted. You discovered that in your book as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, certainly among the wealthy. I mean, the wealthy in the United States in the past, I was quite surprised to learn this, but I mean, they they often um, looked down on people who were who were openly materialistic. There are certainly periods in the past where behaving like the Kardashians would have been um, would have been the kind of thing that would be subject to public ridicule by, um, by the upper class. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, you see swings around that through time. I mean, there are times like the twenties and really the last uh, 20 years where it's been totally acceptable to, to just flaunt your wealth and, wave it in people's faces and <laughs> and celebrate it and be celebrated for it. And then there's been other periods where, uh, particularly in periods like the Depression or the World Wars, um, where it's really seen as inappropriate to do those things because you're, you know, you're advertising privilege at a time when a lot of people don't have those same privileges. So 
there's a lot to be learned, I think, from those histories. You had mentioned that um, in the country of Finland, it's is that right, or that it's it's bad form to display well, ostentatious displays of wealth? Yeah, um, <laughs> Finland is a country with like among sort of the rich world, richer world countries. Uh, it is Finland's a country that's quite a bit more equitable than. Um, than a nation like uh, Canada or the United States, and so there's a there's a uh, I guess a cultural tendency to to police <laughs> showing off your wealth. So yeah, I mean uh, sources. I, when I went there, people were, were telling me like, yeah, you know, if if you're a very wealth wealthy Finn, you can't have you're not going to have 10 Ferraris in different colors uh, because no one would respect you for that choice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if somebody else with like 10 different Porsches or something, I don't know, but as a, as on, on the whole, um, the society as a whole would not find you an admirable person for, uh, for showing off in that way. So um, yeah, I mean, it's just really interesting to see how, these values are expressed very differently in, in different kinds of countries, including in countries where, uh, where you have richer people and poorer people and you have all of the modern conveniences that, um, that wealthy nations have, but very different attitudes to, towards uh, how rich people should be and, and, uh, and how acceptable it is to, to, to like celebrate. Um, being richer than everybody else. <laughs> it's just not done in Finland. Not done in Finland. No, no. Bad they, yeah, form. <laughs> they're grumpy. They have to. The, the rich in Finland have to. Yeah, you know, they have to go to neighboring Sweden, which has a higher and higher tolerance for that. <laughs> we've got uh, we've got another audience question. This will probably be the last one before we close out. Uh, and this one might get a little too in the weeds on monetary theory, but does inflation have any impact here? Uh, what's the real incentive to try and build wealth in an environment where interest rates are lower than inflation? Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is getting into an area where, where uh, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert, but uh, certainly you've seen historically when um, when inflation is higher. Uh, it does tend to, it does tend to suppress. Um, it does tend to suppress. Well, it, it tends to get into when inflation is higher. Societies generally are uh, less accepting of the flaunting of wealth, and there does tend to be a, a more equitable societies. I mean, I guess I would say that's that's the pattern. Um, I'm not going to say that I totally understand the mechanics of, of how that all uh, comes together and plays out. But uh, it's, um, um, yeah, I guess I would just say that uh, certainly there are like tools we can use. And um, uh, for example, maybe one that I'm a little more familiar with is is taxation. I mean, if you look at the taxation of the very, very wealthy um, in in sort of wealthy countries around the world, uh, wealthier people were much, much more highly taxed through most of the 20th century than they are today. And when they were high, more highly taxed, uh, nations were more equitable. When nations are more equitable, uh, the pressure to consume is lower. Uh, so you do see these really like plain structural drivers of the kind of consumerism we do today. Thank you so much, JB. This has been terrific. I'm going to end on a, on a fun note and ask during the pandemic, what item or items did you discover that you didn't need any longer to purchase? Well, you know what I'm going to go with instead is the one that I resisted purchasing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I resisted purchasing was streaming. Oh, not like the rest of the world. No. <laughs> uh, so I just thought to myself, like, hmm, because I, what, I, what I noticed was that uh, people shifted really quickly from consuming 
uh, like when, when you couldn't buy any stuff well, before the online economy got organized and you just couldn't get any products, uh, people shifted to consuming um, online entertainment. So streaming, as you'll remember, shot up so rapidly that at one point, mm -hmm. you know, I think in Europe it was, they were saying like, um, there, you know, YouTube was going to have to run at a lower definition <laughs> because it, there was so much data consumption. Um, so I just thought, well, I'm going to go without the streaming services during the during the pandemic and see what happens. And uh, I I didn't suffer. Um, you know, I the only thing I suffered was not being able to join in conversations about what everyone else <laughs> was watching, but. Um, it gave me an opportunity to really, uh, you know, since I was you know, more or less in lockdown here, it gave me the opportunity to actually use that time to investigate the inside of my own head rather than um, the projections that, <laughs> that uh, other people wanted to put in my head through streaming services. And um, that was a pretty interesting experience, you know, having a lot of time to sit with yourself and, and your thoughts is uh, valuable and a little challenging if because we're just not used to it. <laughs> no, that's fascinating that you were able to resist all the streaming services that um, it was another thought experiment in a way. So <laughs> yeah, that there, there's maybe that's your next book thought experiment. <laughs> You know, resisting streaming in all those social media platforms we communicate on now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us. You can read far more about all these topics that JB and I covered tonight in his book, The Day the World Stops Shopping. Please order that from bookshop.org. Bookshop.org supports independent bookstores across the nation. So thank you again for joining us. I do believe there's also a reading list that we posted in the in the chat. So you can take advantage of JB's uh, theories that you can check those books out of the library as well. <laughs> All other sources. So thank you again, JB. This has been a delight and I am definitely going to curb my purchasing power. <laughs> well, thanks so Instead much. It's been a, it. <laughs> it's been a been a real pleasure, and uh, hopefully, I'll get to Kansas City one day for real. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, I, I don't know. I guess I won't be able to fly there. So I don't know. I'll, somehow, I'll, get, I'll I'll bicycle. You know, and yeah, but yeah you bicycle because, here, and we will buy you your barbecue. <laughs> fantastic. All right, it's a deal. Good night, everyone, and thanks a lot. <laughs>